All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Using Real Data in Your Classroom. We are all so excited to be here with you today. In this session, we're going to focus on building data literacy skills, both for your students and for ourselves as educators. Uh, together, we're going to focus on methods to find and teach you techniques to use real data sets in the classroom. And to do that, we're going to focus on and model a classroom ready activity, uh, one of a series available online for you to use. And we're also going to talk about opportunities for you to continue learning if you're interested um, through programs for teachers and programs for students. Um, at the end, we will have time for Q&A. So we're going to do a lot together during this hour together, and we're all really, really excited about it. Um, my name is Tess Porter, and I'm an educator at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, and I'm joined today by three fantastic guests who are going to walk us through all of that stuff we were just talking about, about uh, learning how to support data literacy in the classroom. I am joined today by Anna Davis. Karen McDonald and Allison Kaywood, who are all from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Uh, they'll be talking a little bit more about themselves and what they do at the center as we dive into today's session. Uh, during today's session, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is available online, and a portion of that is available on the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which we've got a screenshot of the homepage here on the screen. Uh, the Smithsonian Learning Lab is a free online platform for just bring and using digital museum resources across the Smithsonian for learning. I, we're in particular, uh, the activity that we're going to be sharing today is available on the Learning Lab for you to use as is or adapt. A link to that collection is located in the description alongside some other resources we'll be talking about in a bit. If you'd like to learn more about using the Smithsonian Learning Lab after today's session, you can do so at our Help Center, which is uh, the URL is located here on the screen. On the Help Center, you can find step-by-step -step tutorials on how to do everything on the lab, from finding resources to building learning experiences and more. We also have a plethora of recorded sessions just like this one talking about techniques to use museum resources for learning. So if you want to discover more techniques to help bring museum resources into your classroom to engage students, check out the Help Center. In addition, today's session will become part of that collection of videos on the Help Center after it finishes airing. As soon as the session ends, it'll become archived and available at the same link you're watching it at now. So if you need to leave early, if you want to watch something again, if you want to share this with a colleague, you can by sharing the same link on YouTube that you're watching it at now or visiting the Help Center. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of digital resources that we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, you can find these linked at the bottom of the session description. So here you're going to find uh, the Oyster Reef Data Analysis Collection. That's that activity we're going to be going through together alongside links to a ton of resources from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center including a list of publicly available environmental data sets that they've compiled to support all of you. So if you see a digital resource today that you're really curious about and you're not sure where to find it, check the description first. If we happen to miss anything we're sharing today, uh, let us know and we'll add the link to the description after the session's over. So today's session is going to be interactive. We want to hear from you and we want to make sure that we're answering all the uh, questions that you have and we want to hear your ideas for translating this into your classroom. We'll be taking questions throughout. We'll be asking questions of you throughout and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end for those questions that we aren't able to answer as we're going through. So at any time, please share your ideas and questions with us using the chat box, which you'll find to the right of the video on YouTube. And to get us started, we would love to hear uh, where you're joining us from and what you teach. A few of you who have already gotten started sharing that in the chat, thank you. It's always so exciting to see where people are joining us from. I see North Carolina, uh, California, awesome. 
So please take a moment to share uh, where you're joining us from and what you teach in the chat. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. As you get started, I uh, sharing that in the chat, Anna, I think it's a great time to move over to diving into data sets. Sounds good. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, Karen and I are excited today to talk about <clears throat> how to use some real data in your classroom. Um, so as Tess said, we have um, a great data set that comes from our research at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center that we're going to look forward to sharing with you guys. Uh, so Karen and I work in the public engagement group at CERC. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background about CERC in case uh, those of you are not familiar with it on here. So to start off a little bit of background, um, so we come from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which is located in Edgewater, Maryland. Um, so we are part of the Smithsonian. We're one of the handful of um, units with the Smithsonian that does research. Um, we were founded in 1965, uh, CERC specifically, and we exist on about 3,000 acres um, right on the Road River, um, off of the Chess which is a tributary off of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so we have about 16 or so miles of shoreline, which means that we have lots of different nooks and crannies and ecosystems for us to do uh, various research. Um, so we host about 20 research labs and about 150 um, staff at our, our institute. So just to give you a little bit of context about um, the kind of varied ecosystems that we're working in, uh, the red line here, so, to orient you a little bit. So CERC is located um, near Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and the stars here indicate Baltimore and Washington, DC. So we're about equal distance from both of them. Um, and then the red area is outlining our campus. So you can see that we have um, a good chunk of the Road River, as well as some forested and wetland areas where we conduct um, a variety of research. So a little bit about the research that we get to do. Um, because of the varied environments, we have a lot of different opportunities to conduct research on the different ways humans are impacting um, terrestrial um, shoreline and aquatic ecosystems. Um, so we have um, our global change research wetland that has been um, do, conducting research on effects of climate change on wetlands um, for several decades. Um, we have um, active storm, or, uh, excuse me, stream restoration site on campus and um, an active um, program doing research into to streams um, in the region. Um, and then some work done in both forested ecosystems. So looking at things such as um, how increased amounts of um, water inundating into forest is going to affect them as a result of sea level rise as well as, of course, of our um, marine related research. So we have a very active uh, fisheries research lab and that's where the data that we're gonna be talking about today comes from. The other part of CERC, which is where Karen, um, Allison and I come from is the public engagement group. Um, so we deal with everybody who is not staff of, of the CERC institution. Um, so that includes our, um, large intern and fellowship programs. So we have a lot of undergraduate um, as well as graduate students come in and work with us for short periods of time to get experience um, working in science. Um, and then uh, we have, of course, our educational programs where um, Karen and I both sit. Um, so dealing with school groups that come in as well as working um, with, prof uh, with um, educators to um, do professional development. And then um, we also have a very large citizen science program um, with a number of different projects where we get volunteers to come in and help us conduct the research that we do. <clears throat> so a little bit moving now into the overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, we're gonna give kind of an introduction to the idea of data literacy, um, just a definition and why it's, an, it's important, why we're talking about it today. 
Um, we'll give you a little heads up about um, how you can find and use existing data. So we'll be providing a data set, but there's also um, endless opportunities online to find data. So we'll be talking a little bit about how you assess credibility as well as, as, well as um, providing a list of some credible sources where you can find data to use in your classroom. And then finally, Karen's going to walk us through um, this activity from CERC using some authentic data on oyster reefs. So just as an introduction to data literacy, if this idea is new to you, um, data literacy refers to the ability um, for students to understand and evaluate information obtained from data. Um, and we reference um, a uh, research paper that is actually in the um, within the Learning Lab collection for today. Um, that I, I strongly recommend everyone to take a look at. It talks about um, kind of the definition of data literacy as well as um, how it fits within um, a lot of the different concepts that are important in, in science. Um, and it also gives some, some guidance on how to deal with messy data and how to use authentic data that you might find online. Um, so these are some things that we don't get to go into a little bit today, but if um, working with authentic data is something you're interested in, I recommend taking a look at that resource. Um, and why is data literacy important? Why are we talking about this? Um, well, you're probably aware that data is everywhere. Um, you know, we have endless amounts of data that are coming in from all of our different online activities. Um, there's, uh, it's important for um, the development of students' critical thinking skills to be able to work with data and um, evaluate it. And even if we're not creating scientists with what it is that we're doing as teachers, um, the skills related to data literacy are important just for everyone's participation in society. So being able to use those critical thinking skills to understand what, what the data are saying and what that means to them. Um, and when we work with authentic data, it's particularly engaging for students. So it's using um, an authentic context for um, to, to work on data literacy really helps to engage the students a bit better. So as I said, there's an abundance of data available online and just some of the potential um, sources of data include government, nonprofit, or scientific institutions. Um, but when you look for a data source, it's very important that you're um, considering the source of it and the credibility of that source. Um, and I wanna just provide one example here. Um, so the idea of cherry picking data is one in which um, you can take a wide, a, a large amount of data that exists and whittle it down to some um, data points that maybe try to tell a false story that you're trying to um, trying to tell. So, for example, looking at um, global air temperatures, um, if we look at a long-term trend, um, we see from the 1900s to the early 2000s, it, there's an upward trend in the te air temperature. Um, but a um, climate change denier who is trying to disprove global warming Cherry picked some data points from, um, I think it was about 1999 or thereabouts um, into the early 2000s in which there was a, a downward trend, which for that period of time, it was true. But if we looked at the greater range of data, um, it was not as factual. So it's important that when you're finding these authentic sources of data online, that you are considering the, the mission of the person who's sharing the data. Um, so some environmental data sources located online, um, we've listed here, and Tess also shared them in the, the link for um, this webinar today. So there, we have compiled a source of some, um, what we consider to be credible sources of data. Um, and these are primarily coming from um, government agencies, but some of them are other nonprofits. Um, and I will put a, a plug in for data nuggets. So. Um, for the most part, these sources that we're giving you are just raw data that are coming out of large research projects. Um, but data nuggets are um, especially made for educators. They take data, they curate it um, for 
educator use. So it's a great place to find some authentic data that's ready to just be lifted and used in your classroom. So moving into our activity today um, and working with some authentic data that comes from CERC. So what we're gonna be talking about deals with oyster research at CERC. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with oysters or their ecological importance, I'm gonna give you a brief overview before we get into the actual activity. So oyster reefs are um, similar in many respects to coral reefs, but in more these more kind of temperate environments like the Chesapeake Bay, um, they are very important habitat for other critters living in the bay. Um, you can see in this picture here, so it might be a little blurry on your screen depending upon your resolution, but we can see lots of oysters everywhere. And we also see the other things that are living and growing on it. Um, so things like bryozoans, et cetera. So oyster reefs are impre incredibly important, primarily because they provide habitat. They also um, provide other services. So oysters are filter feeders. So they're important in the sense that they can filter the water of the bay. Um, and if you're not local to the Chesapeake Bay, you may not know, but um, water quality is definitely one thing that we struggle with in this area. And oysters are able to clean the water. So this image, um, these are, are pictures of tanks filled with water that came out of the same water source. One tank contained oysters, the other tank did not. And so over a period of time, we can see that the tank with the oysters, they were able to clear the sediment and, and um, small algae that were in the water out and make it a lot clearer. Um, and as I said, they also provide important habitat for other organisms. You um, may understand the importance of this critter, but this is a, a blue, crab, blue crab, which is um, an important dietary staple of us Marylanders. Um, and um, the oyster reefs are a really important habitat for them, but especially for the younger blue crabs. Um, so it's important for, for them and for you know ecological purposes, but also for economic purposes, since these blue crabs are something that we like to catch and eat. Um, so, what has been an issue over time is um, the fishing of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. So, long ago, oysters were very abundant. They were able to provide all of the um, you know, necessary ecosystem services that they provide. But over time, um, we have fished down oysters. And one of the ways that we've done this really efficiently is by using a dredge. So this is essentially just a giant rake with a basket attached to the back of, back of it. And it will drag along the bottom and pick up all of the oysters that um, are, are present. So it allows for a lot of oysters to be taken out at one time. Um, but it also can cause a lot of um, habitat damage to the oyster reefs. And I'll actually come back to this in, in a couple slides and just show what it can do. So because of how efficient um, the oyster fishery using, particularly using the dredge is, um, it's caused a big decline in oyster populations in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so we can see if we look into the, um, 1870s, I believe is when this graph starts, up until um, around 2020, uh, there's a huge decline. And at the lowest point, the oyster population was about at 1% of what they expected um, the historic population to have been. So we're talking about oysters in the Chesapeake Bay, but I know that many of you are coming from different areas. And so I do wanna emphasize that while these examples are local to us, they are, this is a similar story that's going on around the world. So oyster reefs are threatened um, for many of the same reasons that we're experiencing here in the Chesapeake Bay. So while the, it's a local example, it, it is something that, um, you know, if you're, you're coastal or you, um, you know, are focusing on marine life, regardless of where you are, it, it is relevant to you. So, in the Chesapeake Bay, um, in order to kind of help um, replace the, the populations of oysters, um, we've, over the past oh gosh, decade plus, we've been undergoing 
um, a huge oyster restoration project. So this boat, um, you can see on the top here, these are all oyster shells. Um, and each of those oyster shelves has a ton of little tiny baby oysters on them. And so what we've been doing is dumping these oyster shells onto reefs throughout the bay in the hopes that we can start replenishing the, the populations that were um, depleted. And the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance is one group that has been um, really instrumental in these oyster restoration efforts. So finally, where CERC comes in, um, we have our fisheries conservation lab, which is led by Dr. Matt Ogburn. Um, and their lab is responsible for investigating the ecology management and conservation of marine and estuarine fisheries, um, including oyster fisheries. So um, what Matt's lab was interested in pursuing was understanding a little bit about how well this oyster, um, oyster restoration in the bay is working. Um, so historically, the way that the oyster reefs have been um, monitored is by sticking some divers down in the water um, in order to get their eyes on the oyster reefs to count how many oysters were there. And um, this worked well, except it required some really talented and skilled folks and a lot of manpower to stick people down on reefs to do this. Um, so Matt's, uh, Dr. Ogburn's lab was interested in understanding how well oyster restoration was working and trying to develop some new methods in order to answer these questions about um, what's happening comparatively between restored and unrestored areas as well as what was happening between harvested versus unharvested areas. Um, so these are areas shown here on the map. The harvested areas are areas that are orange. So this, these are places where watermen can go out and collect oysters. Um, and then green areas, which are sanctuary sites or unharvested areas. And those are areas that are protected and meant to be these areas where the oysters can grow and replenish and hopefully um, populate the other areas as well. So the new methodology that was developed um, was using these camera systems to put them down onto reefs. So this is a um, plastic PVC frame and down on the bottom you see these um, GoPro cameras. And what they do is essentially take these cameras and throw them overboard, like as shown in this video here, hopefully. At least good visibility days, we can get a good, vis good vision of what's going on down on the oyster reefs. Um, so they can take videos, they can also take stills, and they um, typically will take a couple different video or a couple different images from each reef to get a good sense of how it's looking. So um, just a, a cursory example. Um, comparing some fished or harvested sites versus a sanctuary or unharvested site. Um, if you just take a, a quick look at it, we can see that there are certainly some differences here. Um, and one of them, as I was mentioning before, there's the dredge that will go through and be used for, for harvesting. So that the path of the dredge is pretty clearly visible here um, where the oysters have been dug up and essentially it's just sand in that area. Um, the sanctuary site goes back to the first image I showed of a reef. So there's lots of oysters, lots of other organisms present. Um, and just some of the organisms that we see, things like down here, which are um, tunicates, and they're similar kind of filter feeding um, invertebrate organisms. Um, some feathery bryozoans, which are similar um, kind of filter feeding. Um, and we can, and then, I'm sorry, oysters and others, um, fungi bryozoans. And in general, we can see that there's a lot greater structure, which is important. And there's also a lot greater diversity in these sites that are not being harvested. Right. From there, I'm going to pass it over to Karen. Hi. All right. So thank you very much. I am going to share my slideshow here. Um, let's see. Share screen. Let's see, entire screen. There we go. And Tess, let me know if you can see that. Uh, here are your slides. 
Okay, great. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the data set that we curated specifically from Dr. Ogburn's research using the GoPro images. Now, as any good storyteller and teacher, we do tell stories and we try to make those stories compelling and data is the way to do that. And so the barcode, or I'm sorry, the code that you see on the screen there, that takes you to our learning lab um, data set where there are resources that we're going to talk about. Again, Tess mentioned that is in the um, description of the program. And we'll also talk about two other data sets uh, very briefly at the end of our discussion that are also available for you from our research here at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. We're going to focus on these oysters. So what's in the lesson? Now, we know you don't have a ton of time. And so what we did is we talked to Matt and we said, hey, can you give us some of your data that we can take and distill down into a compelling understanding story that teachers could use in their classroom? Now, this is aimed at anywhere from upper middle school to high school range. Students can sort data that's already been processed, so they can take the raw data that we give you, or they can collect their own data from pictures and images that we provide. You. So we'll give you 50 still images um, from Broad Creek, which is an unrestored um, creek with oyster reefs. We'll have 50 still images in Harris Creek, which is a restored or protected environment of oyster reefs. There's a blank data set, a filled in data sheet, um, which we already have the data collected and analyzed for you. There are two GIS story maps in there. And I know I saw in some of the comments, um, people are interested in uh, connecting uh, human impact, you know, other cross-cutting curriculum, that's a good way to do it because it goes through some of the history of oysters and how oysters are important to the environment and to people and how then that has had an impact on the environment and the reefs and why we're trying to restore them. And then also there's a paper with suggestions for statistical analysis. And again, in that middle school to upper high school range. Um, so there are some anchoring questions that we suggest that are in there for you. And that includes things like what type of sites have the best habitat score? And we're going to talk about that. Um, and regardless of the tributary, do harvested or non-harvested oyster reefs have a better habitat score? How does oyster restoration affect biodiversity? Which even if you don't live near the Chesapeake Bay, that's an important question. How does restoration affect biodiversity in other habitats? So this can be a gateway into other studies, even in your area. And then regardless of the tributary, does harvesting affect biodiversity? And then what's the relationship between biodiversity and habitat scores? And so students are taking on that role of being a scientist, taking the data that actually comes from our bay and from our scientists and trying to answer some of these anchoring questions. You can choose which one fits best for you. So it's kind of a choose your own adventure in this regards for your classroom. And the important thing about this is really all about habitat because oyster reef structure is what's important here. Um, you can have the same quantity of oyster reefs, but if the quality isn't there, it's not going to be good habitat for organisms. So if you have an oyster reef that's laid out in a pancake pattern that's maybe been harvested by those dredges, it doesn't have the nooks and crannies and places for those creatures to live. It's sort of like a forest that's not very tall and doesn't have many places for things to live. Whereas a vertical reef, which is kind of like a high rise apartment or an old growth forest, has lots of places for animals to live and hide. There's food, shelter, places for those creatures to be. And so when we score habitat, in this case in particular, we're looking at vertical structure to see, you know, what's there. And based on that vertical structure. And so we're actually gonna do a little bit of this together. Um, I wanna give you the rubric and this is what you would do with your students. The rubric is zero to three, so it's pretty easy. Zero is no oysters, it's bare sand or mud. One is a few oysters with some sand or mud. There may be a few here and there, but there's not much habitat, it's less than 50%. 
There might be number two is some oysters, but it's pretty flat. So it's not going to get any higher than maybe one or two inches high, which is about the width of an individual oyster. But three is what we're aiming for. That's a lot of oysters with vertical structure. That's our apartments. That's our big habitat where the shell height's bigger than two inches high. And that's where you'll start to see oysters growing in clusters. So I want to share with you some of the pictures or images that come directly from this data set that I'm talking about and we can practice doing some of this scoring together so in the comments please feel free um, to help provide an answer and I know the picture may be a little small depending on what screen you're watching on but take a look at this image if you were a student trying to, to score this habitat just like a scientist what would you score this as a zero a one a two or a three what do you think so put your comments in the chat or just think to yourself what would you score it as and then I'll tell you what our scientists said. Give right. um, our audience a moment to take a look, put their answers in the chat. Sometimes there's a little bit of lag before sure. I, they put it in and it gets to us. Okay, I see a rating of zero. That would be no oysters, bare sand or mud. Uh -huh. While I wait for other responses to come in too, I think that was my first impression. I see a lot of sand here, not a lot of that growth I was seeing in some of the pictures you were showing earlier. And I, I see more comments coming in thinking about one, maybe there are a few oysters there, lots of ones and twos. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's take a look at what the scientists said. The scientists actually said oysters are less than 50%. So there are a few in there. It's hard to see. And in fact, this is where having a computer screen is really useful because you can blow this image up, right? So you can actually enlarge that to get a little bit better look, which is the nice thing about these picture data sets is that students can actually take a look and make things bigger to try and make a, a best guess or judgment in that regard. So let's try another one. This one's pretty easy. What do you think? Again, Look at that structure. <laughs> yeah, I, I see what is uh, reminding me of a little bit of that high rise structure you were talking about um, mm -hmm. earlier. Correct. And if you look carefully, you can see organisms living on the oyster shells. And oysters are kind of nondescript. They kind of do look like rocks, um, but they are living organisms. They are the invertebrates living in those shells. They have little gaps and they're filtering that water. So our scientists in this one, they're going to say a three. So those of you that said a three, great. That is true. Um, you do have greater than 50% individual height and more than one oyster. So it is a three. So you've got good vertical structure. Now here's a little bit more challenging image where students might struggle a little bit, but this is a good chance for them to look at surface area and coverage. So take a look at that one. So you can see the oyster shells. They're definitely there. There is some structure. What do you think? While we wait for responses to come in, you know, I'm seeing what looks like more life than that first image uh, that we took a look at. And I think that's a lot of the votes that are coming in here too. What I was thinking internally, uh, a lot of votes for two. Correct. All right. So our scientists actually said two. So good job. So they did say there are some oysters. It's greater than 50% um, of the coverage that you have there. And so that would be a two. And then this last one is kind of challenging. I put this one in on purpose. Um, so this is a little bit trickier. So looking at this, you see some vertical structure. You see some oyster shells. But what do you think you would say versus what a student would say? And you notice that the color of this water is kind of a, a greenish color. And that's because the water where we are has a high plankton um, content and it often has a lot of sediment in it. Um, so that's why you see this kind of greenish background compared to some of those that are a little bit clearer. So 
I see some votes coming in, and in this case, it is a one. And so that's how our scientists ranked it. There's very few oysters. There is a little vertical structure, but it's not enough to categorize it as a two, right? And so this is a good chance for students to work in teams or pairs to cross check or to do their own work and then to compare um, and make an argument from data, um, which goes along with our next generation science standards for what they chose, right? And so in terms of the data sets, I mentioned that you will be giving you 50 pictures from each of the creeks, from the restored and unrestored. Um, you can choose to use 25, you can use 50, you can use as many as you like. We did the analysis for you, which is all in that teacher packet, but in general, there are some trends from that analysis. And those trends have indicated, based on what our scientists have found, is that restored and non-harvested reefs do have the highest average habitat score while the non-restored, non-harvested have the second highest. And then the data does suggest that harvesting is what contributes to that lack of structure and that lack of biodiversity, which to us, you know, to may sound like, oh yeah, that just makes sense. Well, this is what we're testing. This is what students need to try to learn. And scientists can't take that for granted. They have to go out and gather that data, collect it and understand it to help decision makers who are doing restoration support their choices with evidence. And so that's why this type of analysis is so important. So the other thing that um, I do want to share with you, and I'll answer questions here in a little bit about the data sets. I'm more than happy um, to talk more about that because I love data. Um, but I did want to share with you two other data sets that we have um, that are available for you that we've curated specifically from the research that our scientists do at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. So the oyster data set um, is our newest one, but we also have one based on leaves and climate change. And then another one that is river otter behavior, which is footage that's coming from trail cameras from our docks. And so just to give you a quick idea, the leaves and climate change one um, kind of is jumping off from research that's been done at the Museum of Natural History, but they specifically have looked at climate change and the impact um, on trees and on leaves over time. Now, one of the things that scientists have figured out over a long period of time is that you can look at the margins of leaves and figure out if they're smooth or if they're toothed, and that ratio of smooth to tooth can actually tell you what the climate in your region is. And I've tested this with leaves from across the United States, and it is accurate. And so I would be curious if you're from another country, um, to if you test this, please let me know. I would love to, to hear more. But essentially in this data set, we have pictures of leaves from around the US and those leaves have been taken from students. The students took these pictures for us. And so students are supposed to take those pictures and determine the number of smooth edged and toothed edged leaves. Now that sounds easy, but it's not, especially when you get into some uh, leaves that have certain bumps and ridges. And so students have to work together to figure out what those look like. And this all correlates to the fossil record because if you look at trees and leaves, they change over time based on climate. And so this is just one way that we can take history from the past, leaves from the fossil record, and our modern, our modern leaves and figure out what our climate is. And so all of that is in um, the learning lab, the data set, as well as the fossil record data set that's in there from the Natural History Museum, as well as our modern day data sets from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Um, so that's all in there for you. The other one, which is one of my all time favorites is river otters. And so at um, our site, we actually have a floating dock where I do all my education programs. And over the last four years, we've had trail cameras out there observing river otters. And river otters are not well studied in the Chesapeake Bay. So we've been making some really fun observations of their behavior. We've uh, are been collaborating with our marine disease ecology laboratory looking at diet. But in this case, I took images from our trail cameras and I have curated that into a set of videos 
along with a student data sheet and a teacher cheat sheet, don't worry, it's all in there, um, where students can analyze videos of otters and raccoons interacting in something that's called kleptoparasitism, which is essentially just the otters bringing big fish up onto the dock and the raccoons have figured out how to steal that fish and take it away from them. And so I'll show you an example video that students might watch and they're very short, they're about 30 seconds long each. And so these are two of our river otters. You see the one there eating a big old fish. Watch the back. The second one totally ditches his friend. You're going to see some eyeballs appearing here. Oh, it buffered a little bit. But we'll see if we can, uh, I'll see if I can pull it up again in a little bit, maybe there, Tess. But essentially what you're seeing is the raccoon runs up, touches the back of the otter, grabs the fish, and then runs off. And you would think that a large apex predator, like a river otter, would actually, you know, fight that raccoon. And what we've seen time and again is that they don't. But the behavior of the otters and the raccoons changes over time because the raccoons start patrolling more when they realize that the otters are coming up and bringing up these big fish. And that poor otter, otter looks just like completely confused about where his fish went, which is really sad. Um, but all of this is in that data set um, of videos that students can watch, or you can just take the data that I've already processed and use that with your classes, right? So there's fun stories that you can tell with our data sets, everything from climate near region to otters and, <laughs> and raccoon behavior, and the biggest one of all, which is our oysters and uh, the story of reefs and habitat and why that's important, telling that story of restoration and how oyster habitat vertical structure is important for ecosystems, which no matter where you live can be correlated to vertical structure in forests or ecosystems near you as well. Okay, so that's what I've got for you. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand it back over to you, Tess. Thank you so much, Karen and Anna. This was really, really cool. I love the opportunity that these images and data sets present to engage students, especially those that this might be a little bit more daunting to, and um, enable them to dive into the same type of research and analysis work that environmental scientists in the field are doing. It's super cool to be able to have access to that um, and especially see things like that in action. Like I've seen the, the raccoon and otter video before and it's just really cool to see how that works. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we're going to dive into our Q&A. So for those of you in the audience, if you have any questions about what we've talked about today, um, for example, if you want to learn more about a resource we talked about briefly, or you've got some questions about a particular thing that you're puzzling over for your classroom. Maybe you want to dive into a particular topic and you're not sure where to find a data set that might help support that, or you're looking for more information and teaching techniques that could help you out, please put that in the chat. Um, while you think about questions, uh, I have one for the three of you. So I know that this isn't the only opportunity to, you know, learn how to, you know, explore using data sets in the classroom. And uh, it isn't the only opportunity to work with um, data from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. I wondered if you could talk more about programs that you're offering this spring and the summer for uh, teachers and students. I know we have some links in our description too where folks can find more uh, or learn more about those. Sure, Allison, do you wanna talk about the research experience for teachers that we have? Sure, so hi everybody. Um, so a lot of our things are Currently, for we're doing a lot of stuff that's focused on place-based learning, which means a lot of it is kind of restricted to those in the DC area. But for those of you who might be more local, we have a couple of things that we do. So one is our, um, like Karen mentioned, our research experience for teachers program, and that is where we have teachers come and do an externship at CERC. So it's a 
paid summer experience. They come and they spend time embedded with the labs. We do a lot of work related to data literacy and working with data and how do you find data about where you live and how do you find data um, that is in the communities where your students live. Um, so that's so you know those are six weeks opportunities those are paid we work with um, teachers all through the school year i know the link for that one was there um, so that's one and if you have a little less time you can't commit to the whole summer um, anna also runs a whole series of workshops that are based on um, based on chesapeake bay and looking at the science and how the science interacts with the history and culture um, and economics um, of Chesapeake Bay. So she does those that are one day workshops and she does some of those that are three day workshops and we have them both for um, formal K-12 teachers and teachers who are teaching in um, either informal environments or in less formal environments. So we do try to cover a wide range of opportunities for educators. Awesome, thank you. And before we dive into the questions in chat, I wonder if you could talk more about the Citizen Science Program. Sure, so Citizen Science is this idea of people um, who are participating in authentic research, right? So they are actually collecting data that is being used by researchers by you know to do real science. Um, and that can look a lot of different kinds of ways, like for the stuff that we do here, some people come to us and they work on our campus. We also have some things that are online where volunteers participate there, or they can, there are projects where people can participate from anywhere where you, where you are, from your home or from your, if you have a dock in your neighborhood, or if you have forested areas in your neighborhood, um, you can participate from any of those places. Um, and increasingly, we're starting to work with community groups and having people collect data from different places where they are. So like their church or a park or somewhere that's near them and setting up and coordinating through that. So we do that through here. But if it's citizen science has grown tremendously in the past 15 or so years as kind of a practice. And so regardless of where you are, if you are near a university, if you are near a um, like a park, if you are near um, a science center of any kind, chances are very, very high that those places are have citizen science projects that are running and there are ways that you can get involved and your students can get involved. Um, there are also some sites, um, there's one that is called Zooniverse that does a lot of image-based citizen science, another that's called SciStarter, which is like an aggregator site and pulls lots of different citizen science projects. And there's a, in the, if you're in the United States, the federal government has a project list of all the federally funded citizen science projects. So you can look at those. And there are some that are built just to be in K-12 classrooms. We are not running it at the moment, but we've run one in the past related to orchid conservation that we ran in middle school and high school classrooms. Um, so there's lots of really great opportunities out there and happy to talk more about that offline with anyone who might be interested in specific things. Cool, thank you, Allison. Uh, so it looks like we've got a couple meaty questions in chat. I'm gonna bring up the first one um, from Michelle. Michelle asks, do your resources provide any protocols for examining data? I have an eighth grade house that will be doing uh, an interdisciplinary set of units looking at water access. And Anna, I don't know if you want to address that one. Is that's in the paper that you had talked about earlier? Yeah, so um, I think that the paper focuses more on um, how educators can kind of curate data sets for use by their students. I'm not so there might be some useful information in there um, regarding that as far as like cleaning up data. Um, you know, making sure that the data set is going to be um, sufficiently small for, you know, a, a student to be able to handle. Um, but as far as, um, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself to the next question, but as far as um, help for students and they're working with the data, I, I think it, it doesn't um, get into that as much. 
Right. I will put a plug in, though, is that Anna and I both run um, teacher workshops. And so one of the things that we specialize is in teaching teachers how to curate data, how to ask good questions, how to help students ask good questions to reach that data set that's usable because oftentimes students have great ideas. So if you're doing this water access, they're going to have amazing ideas, but they're going to be so high level they could do a PhD on it, right? Um, so you got to bring that back in, you got to bring it back down. And so we talk about that using examples um, from CERC research, um, things like this oyster data, but others. And so I would definitely say, please reach out to us. Um, we do virtual teacher professional development. We do some here at our site where we will do some immersive things as well. Um, and we also do virtual programs. And so I've done programs where I actually send otter scat into the classroom where you look at dried fish scales and otter poo. Um, it's perfectly clean but you analyze diet with one of our scientists or myself where we're talking about um, diet. And so we can do that and we can help you with some of those things. So please definitely consider us for that. Okay, and Tess, I think there was another one there too. Yeah, yeah, and I think we started touching upon it, but from Dorinda, Dorinda asks, do your modules have suggestions for giving immediacy for students? For example, using the module for the practice and skills, but creating their own data sets and applying it to their own communities. That's a lot harder one. And that again is where we would have to work with you one-on-one -on -one because these data sets are really curated around our own data that we're providing you, right? And we're hoping at some point soon to offer more of these specialized um, things. And then Allison, did you wanna sort of talk to that as well? Yeah, I was gonna say, um... So that idea of having students collect data and data that are meaningful is, is another important part of the whole data literacy thing. I would recommend as some resources to start looking at. Um, our colleagues from the Smithsonian Science Education Center have um, a series of what they call um, Smithsonian it's the global goals, right? Global goals, yeah, guides for global goals. That's not right, I'm getting it all wrong. Um, but they have this series of, um, of guides that can be used in both formal and informal learning contexts. And they kind of lead students through understanding some of the issues that are relevant in their communities on a variety of topics related to things like climate change or biodiversity or sustainability. Um, and having them collect data and try to start to like think about what data they need and what data they can find and pulling together data that they collect as well as data that may already exist about the places where they are. So those are really good frameworks for doing some of that kind of work. Thank you, Tess, for putting the link in there that after I mangled the name. Um, <laughs> Science for Global Goals. Thank you for that, Allison. And we've got another question here thinking about um, adaptability for different uh, grade levels. Amy asks, do you think the OYSTER data could be scaled down for use in upper elementary? We were looking at participating in the Billion OYSTER project and the data would add to that. I'm not familiar with the Billion OYSTER data project. Anna, are you familiar with that one? Yeah, I think that's happening up in the Hudson Bay, I'm pretty sure, around New York. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I would say, I would say yes, I think that elementary students probably would be able to, you know, do some of the analysis of the, the images. Um, I think probably the, the kind of statistics that we go into might be above their head, but I, I feel like they probably could do some comparisons of, you know, um, the restored or unrestored sites and, and looking to see what kind of differences are there as far as the, the structure. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I think with what's going on with the Billion Oyster Project, I think it's, it's relevant. I think it would tie in well with that. And Amy, one of the things that I do on site when we actually sort through oyster baskets and we look at biodiversity is I take oyster shells and I challenge the students to make an oyster reef using the shells. And then they, I've already created some little plastic fish and shrimp and creatures out of clay that I have them hide in there. And then I have another group of students try to find as many of the organisms as possible without touching the shells. So we talk about biodiversity that way. We talk about, okay, well, how did this reef with more vertical structure hide more creatures than this flat reef? Um, and where did you find more of those organisms? And so that was just a 
good way of modeling oyster reef biodiversity. So you can have some fun with that with the students. Um, I've even gone to the bait store and bought the little rubber grass shrimp and fish and things. It's ridiculous. Yes, I know. We're teachers. We do these things um, to hide in those model reefs. So you can get pretty creative with doing some of that modeling. Thank you, too. Um, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but as we look at wrapping up the session, uh, I really appreciate what the three of you have shared about opportunities to learn more and even brainstorm with you about how to uh, bring particular types of data sets to students through, for example, professional development. Um, is there an email that anyone or a website contact form if anyone would like to get in touch that you'd recommend they use? Yeah, they can use, um, it's our CERC outreach. It's S-E-R-C outreach at si.edu. And that will come to all of us and the rest of our public engagement team. So we can get you to the right person for whatever it is that your question or request is. Cool. Absolutely. I just put that in the chat for everybody. Um, while uh, final questions come in and comments too, please feel free to put them in the chat. I wanted to uh, share a couple final things with all of you. Uh, like I said earlier, this session is uh, being recorded and it will be automatically archived as soon as the session ends. So if you want to rewind this, uh, share it with someone else, you can. Uh, by uh, visiting it at the YouTube link you're watching it at now. You'll also be able to find it on the Learning Lab Help Center alongside other videos exploring how to use museum resources with students and information on diving into the Smithsonian Learning Lab where uh, that activity that we've been talking a lot about, about exploring oyster reef data and additional data activities for exploring climate and otters can be found, um, that's a great place to get started. Uh, additionally, we're hosting a couple more webinars in the next month that I wanted to make sure we're on your radar. Um, this Thursday, uh, February 23rd from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, we're hosting a Black Women's History pop-up exploring how to uh, dive into frequently untold stories of Black women and American history in the classroom. And for that session, we're going to be joined from wit by educators from six Smithsonian museums. So it's going to be a busy session. And then um, for another session very similar to this one in our Cultivating Learning series, we explore uh, techniques for using museum resources with students. Uh, join us on Wednesday, March 15th from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern for a session on exploring how to support positive identity development with museum objects with the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Those dates and links to those sessions will be found on our Help Center and our home page as well on the Smithsonian Learning Lab. With that, it looks like there are no more questions. So thank you all for joining us today, for uh, participating with us as we looked at images and for asking such great questions. Um, it was really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And thank you, Karen, Anna, and Allison for sharing your expertise and ideas with us today. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, thank you everyone. Have a good rest of your day.